Hi my Rockworld fans, we are here in Blaubeuren and have an exclusive interview with the master drummer Billy Copham. So welcome Billy. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, some facts about Billy Copham. He uh, started to play the drums and got into jazz with the Horace Silver band and a lot of more things. And uh, he defined the genre jazz rock fusion around about the beginning of the 70s with the famous Mahavishnu Orchestra. He was the founding member. After the break of the band, he started to do a solo career and uh, he had awesome uh, solo CDs. The master CD spectrum is known by everybody which uh, is known for the jazz rock genre. Also he had uh, a band together with George Duke which passed away last week for sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the best live fusion rock CDs ever and um, uh, played with Jack Bruce, played with a lot of other bands, also had a great band with the Grateful Dead guys, uh, Jazz is Not Dead which I, which I like a lot and uh, so he did a last uh, studio album Palindrome which came out 2000 then and then a very great live CD and DVD Life and Live Akusen 2012. Uh, we heard that you're working now on a new studio album. Tell us about something and uh, when will it be out? The studio album is called Tales from the Skeleton Coast and uh, it will be released at the beginning of January 2014. Uh, it's an extension, it's the third in a series uh, of uh, projects called uh, Fruit from the Loom, uh, of which I, I have the first album, Fruit from the Loom, the second uh, is Palindrome, and then now this one. Uh, it will be followed by a compilation DVD, including everyone uh, that's taken part in this series, the Fruit from the Loom series, and that particular project is called dunes that move and that will, is not scheduled for release before 2015 okay and are you playing uh, some new tunes on on your concert today oh uh, yeah from sure the, the, the opening the uh, from from the tales from the skeleton coast uh, recordings will be uh, a piece called uh, pomegranates uh, okay. which is the opening tune on the record and the the closing piece on the record is called Tales from the Skeleton Coast. And, and the record is, is it, uh, um, are you recording it or is it ready? It's already ready. Okay. It, it, it's, in, it's in mastering mode right now. So that's the last point of production before we pass it on to the distributor. And, and you played it with the actual tour band or are there? With uh, the actual there... tour band, yeah. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. So really band project. Yeah, it, it, yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. These things don't happen that often anymore, but I'm still yeah, old school. It. I can't help yeah. it, you know. Cool, that's cool. Yeah. So it will come out 2014, and it's a, a studio. It's a studio, studio with complete new tunes. Yes. yes. Very mm -hmm. great. Um, Billy, you are one of the explorers, and not the explorers. You defined the jazz rock and fusion uh, genre, and if I can say that, for me, you are the the most well-known drummer from the jazz rock fusion music and the number one drummer of this genre. You are one of the founders with, from, uh, with the Mahavishnu Orchestra with John McLaughlin. How come the musicians together for the Mahavishnu Orchestra and what are your memories now about touring and recording in that time in the past? It was a really a higher school of higher education equivalent to other experiences that I I had had uh, one being with Miles Davis, uh, one being with uh, in a way yeah with Peter Gabriel, uh, where in Peter's school it was about f me learning, or experiencing working with with audiences, a listening audience, seriously listening audience yeah. of more than twenty thousand people. Uh, on a daily basis. Which As a matter of fact, we what what makes it so special is because as a jazz player, yeah, I'm used to playing clubs. Yes, I'm used to playing 
average 500 seats and I can play a lot of complicated pyrotechnical patterns and all of that and get away with it and it it gets it it they these patterns relate translate in, uh, to the people who are listening nearby if I do that in front of the average house that Peter played in uh, to at the time which was somewhere the average concerts we played averaged about 70,000 people Cross. okay awesome. so our largest was, uh, 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 I forget the name of the place now, but was we it, played, it was in England and it was, we played the 300,000 people. With the Mahavishnu Orchestra? No, this was with Peter Gabriel. Oh, this is and, uh, awesome. Awesome. And the smallest, uh, a rehearsal by word of mouth in Hanover at the, at the big exposition hall, it was a new hall and they needed to test a new sound system. <laughs> and so they just told his his club members mm -hmm. and 45,000 people showed up. Awesome. And there wow. were too many people to get, to, get <laughs> to, play, to get into the place. <laughs> and so that was the smallest. We played Rock and Rain, which is the old Munich airport. Yes. And that was 85,000 people. And that was the very first opening show of our tour in 1994. And then we played the Rock and Ring, yeah. and that was uh, 125,000 people. And every place in between, like Cologne or so, or uh, in Denmark, Copenhagen, and nothing ever went below, nothing went below 60,000, 75, after 45. So this is very different, uh, like in the chess clubs. Because you have to play, yeah. uh, do you have to play out, uh, in another so, way? And then I understood. Why rock drummers? Because yes. sometimes we were uh, performing opposite, say, Arrow Smith or Guns N' Roses yes. or something like this, mm -hmm. and the drummers would play, and the hands would be way up here, and you know, and and I, I used to chuckle and say, "What's his problem?" You know, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> and then, and and the big, huge sticks from the parade, you know. And, Looked like he was playing uh, uh, the the koto drum or something. Yeah. Big drums and uh, why you know? Uh, now I understand. Now I understand why. Because it doesn't translate to the audience in the back. You're right. Nobody knows it. No one sees this. They hear it. The 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 delay in time can be as much as ten seconds. Yes. And that's a very, very, very long time. Not even one second, but ten it's seconds. A <laughs> so it's like, time. pop. God. <laughs> 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 and all you see, and then the other thing is, you're watching the people. Yeah. And they are, you start to get seasick on stage. Because of the because you can't you lose your rumble. perspective on on, yeah. on where who how what's going on is that are those people I really see even with lights and, yeah. and you know uh, flashlights and all of this it's very difficult. But it's also it, uh, when you when you did the concerts with the Mahavishnu Orchestra there were also big festivals like mm -hmm. the Marius yes, Hall yes, Festival it's true. yeah. Where uh, there is uh, there's a new combination of the Mahavishnu Orchestra which I like a lot because there is an unreleased live concert yeah. from that time also from Marisol mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. other tunes which yeah. is, sounded great mm -hmm. and I think in Marisol how much people were there? 125,000. 125,000. There yeah. were Emerson Lake and Palmer and all other bands. Yeah, we beyond. played. We played it. We played midday, and they estimated 125,000 people at noon in Puerto Rico. In, uh, you know, outside of Ponce, I mean, and I, I know, I trust me, I had water, ice water thrown on my head just to stay cool. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't know if I'd be here. Are you still in contact with some of the guys of Mahavishnu? I worked with Jerry Goodman last uh, January for the first time in 30-something, no, no, for the second time in 30, almost 40 years. Because just just passing in the night, and so we did something, and uh, then it's back out on my own again. John McLaughlin, I see from time to time, uh, either at a convention or or thereabouts. We 
we performed together in Montreux. In Montreux as a duet. Yes, I saw it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that we played together since 1983 or 84. Yeah. And uh, Jan recorded on my drum and voice album. That was sometime about maybe somewhere around five, six years ago. Okay. And I heard his voice for the first time in 30 plus years then to say to me, Awesome. I, and, and bizarrely enough, I had my cell phone in my pocket and I was, I was flying to, yeah, we were, we were doing something for Pete. I was going to Sri Lanka. It was the year of the tsunami. Yeah. And I was flying from Vancouver to, to Beijing, I think, to make a connection flight down there to, to, uh, to um, Sri Lanka, to Colombo. And the phone rang as we were taking off. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, hello. And he said, Billy, it's Jan. I said, hey, how you doing? It was like <laughs> we had spoken not at all in 30 plus years. Really? And they, yeah, what's up? And, or how are you doing? Something like he says, it's John Hammer. I said, I know, I know. The voice doesn't change. What's up? What's going on? You call me. Well, how do you want me to treat this, uh, the, the tune? I said, what tune? He said, on oh, drumming voice. I said, play like John Hammer. He said, what? I said, you know, the keyboard player that played in Mahavishnu, and he started laughing. I said, play like him. <laughs> Listen, I gotta go. We're taking up. <laughs> and that was the end of it. Well, I haven't cool. heard from him since. <laughs> this is cool. This is a cool story. <laughs> and Rick Lott from. Oh, from Rick, Rick, I see all the time. Really? Yeah. Rick is he still playing? Uh, not only for himself. Rick is an incredible photographer. He was with Vogue magazine last I heard and probably got his gold watch by now. But there will not be a reunion of the Mahavishnu Orchestra? No, there will not. Um, Why? Because we've grown older and crotchety like ginger. And, and we moved on to different things. Um, Jan doesn't play live anymore. He, does not, he doesn't play any live performances. He played eight performances with Jeff Beck. And that was it for the last 35 years. Poor. Yeah. Thereabouts. After the break of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, which uh, was around about 1972, 1973, you started on a really successful solo career and uh, the first album, which is called Spectrum, mm -hmm. had great guys on the, as guests. Also Tommy Bolin, which was known for a mm -hmm. rock band. Mm -hmm. uh, how how come Tom Bo Tommy Bolin into the project for Spectrum? It was divine providence, man. That's all I can say. It was just something that was meant to happen. I had other options, and for some reason, he fit perfectly. Yeah. Uh, it was the same thing as, as, you know, playing, doing rehearsals with Stanley Clark and uh, other bass players. And everything was like kind of okay, kind of not. And then all of a sudden, in the same office, management office as, as Mahavishnu was a band called The Section. And the bass player in The Section was a guy by the name of Leland Sklar. Which is one of the greatest bass players. And I sort of opened the door and there was Lee. I said, hey Lee, what you doing? I mean, I just saw him. I said, you busy tonight? He said, uh, no. I said, well, you have time to do a session? He said, no, okay. So we went down to Jimi Hendrix's place and met and recorded. <laughs> This is cool. <laughs> I was on A Street and, you know, it was pretty reasonable and we all sort of went down and, to see what was going to happen. And, you know, everybody was kind of free and kind of not, but for this we were free. So, so what I understand is, uh, or I hope I understand it right, mm -hmm. is that the Spectrum uh, album is, is a, a, a session project? It was a session project. Really? Mm -hmm. Because it looks, it, 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 it sounds very fresh. Mm -hmm. But it sounds it, because they are the songs all are, are re yeah. composed. Mm -hmm. But it was a session note. Well, all I did was you know everybody knew what, what needed to be done. I what what one lesson I learned from Miles was to match the musicians with the music. Okay. If you can find the right people who feel comfortable with what you've written, you won't have to tell them what to do. They'll do it because that's what they do. That's cool. So Jan, I knew what to do. 
Tommy, I knew exactly. I mean, we, we just, what we did was just, we may have played each tune of the four, I think we have about seven tunes, let's say five tunes or whatever it is on that record that they played on three times. We did, we made those recordings in less than four hours. The, we, whole, the whole album? Their section. Their sections. And then the following day, I worked with Ron Carter, Jimmy Owens, uh, Jan, and Joe Farrell uh, on the rest. It was two tunes. And that was it. And uh, we were in and out of there a couple of days, max. Cool. And it's the masterpiece in jazz rock. Mm -hmm. Spectrum is really the masterpiece. The heavy thing about Tommy, Tommy is like the male version of Amy Winehouse. And by the way, they both died at the age of 27. Okay. Okay. They'd walk in. I mean, in, in, at real world, she'd come in. She'd be a bit of a mess, but that was a whole other story. Yeah. But when she sang, she sang. Yeah. Understand. Everything was fine. Yeah. Okay. And woof, gone. You know, yeah. that, that's not with everybody. And sometimes you have to wonder, you say, okay, um, these people weren't meant to be here past this time. Yeah. And I only knew Tommy Bolin for eight years. Mm -hmm. And of that, and when he recorded, he died in 1977. He recorded with me in 1973. Yeah. Okay, and he was 27. So he was 23, 24 years old. That was it, man. Yeah. And then he went out with Deep Purple and all yeah. of that. Yeah. And, it was, and Big Star and poof, gone. Yeah, you're right. You played and recorded also with George Duke. The Life in Europe mm -hmm. album is a masterpiece too. And George Duke passed away last week. Yeah. So some words and memories about your relationship with George Duke. It was a great uh, a relationship, musical relationship that, that uh, everything connected. Um, we agreed. It was like a, a, a strong bond. You know, when we were on the bandstand, even after we, we made that record, 1998, we, you fast forward to it. Yeah. And you can see this thing called Rush Hour. Yeah. And that was a, a one hour rehearsal after not having performed together since 1978. Wow. Because, I mean, chips passing in the night. Yeah. And it was like another day at the office, you know. Mm -hmm. Music had no problem. You know, some people are like that. The same thing with McLaughlin. For years, and then we get on the bandstand, and Claude Knob says, I need an hour, or I need 35 minutes. What do you want us to do? Anything. Okay, here we go. And it, it was together. Yeah, because we only found that out. We only, uh, we only met each other. The concert started at 8.30 or thereabouts, and we met each other at 6 that evening. Wow. I said, what do you want to play? He says to me. I said, me? I said, what do you want to play? He says, I know some tunes. <laughs> I said, well, okay, what about, what about what we used to play? He says, uh, I know the beginnings. I said, well, what about the ends? He says, no, I don't remember them. <laughs> I said, this is cool. okay, so just play. So we played for 35 minutes and then got an encore for another 10. And it's and this is this was not just a, a stupid rock and roll song. It was complicated music. Yeah, we just played what we played, and it was forty five minutes of, of random whatever. And uh, and people turned around and said, "You can't leave now." And then Claude is saying, "You know, you don't need a band. You can do this together." And I'm and I'm gonna say, "I need to go home <laughs> right now. My wife is waiting for this me is, home." This is cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, Billy, who were your heroes that made you start a music career too? Oh, man. It seems like the whole music world. I had everybody to listen to. I was very blessed, you know, with the Latin world, the jazz world. I didn't listen to a lot of rock and roll at all. I was just, I mean, my family is a, a, is a, a Panamanian family. Yeah. From, you know, and so we just, there was music in the house all the time. But so it was, was the... Like One a, specific person? Specific no, birth, like no drums. Like or something? No, nothing. No, no. I listened to Basie's band. Okay. I listened to Ellington's band. Every time I was listening to somebody, there was a leader in front. 
And the drummer, oh yeah, by the way, the, 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 the drummer was there, but the reason why I didn't hear the drummer is because the band sounded good. And the lesson in that was that the drummer was supposed to help the band sound good, not stand out. So therefore, Buddy Rich was never my idol because he always stood out. Okay. He was always better than everybody else. Okay. You know, he was, he was technically three or four levels more proficient than anybody else on their instrument, right? Mm -hmm. Which made him stand out, which, made the, which held the band back for me. If he played for the band, if he played within the band, I probably, he would have been an also, a, just a name in the past, yeah, man, he really locked in, you know, but that was about it. I love Mel Lewis, I love people like that who's, who made the Thad Jones Mel Lewis band l live, and Mel, which if you put him by himself, he sounded like he was falling, in, falling through a bunch of garbage cans walking down the street. Yeah. Now, they were always in his way. But it was extremely musical. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, and then, ba, da, da, ba. And you go, <laughs> how did he do that? You know? Okay. And then I had the pleasure and the honor of sitting down at his drum set to fill in for him one Monday night at, at, a, at a performance because he was busy doing some other concert. And that's when I understood why Mel sound the way he, all the drums were very loose. The snare drum was like this. And you go, no, I could never make this work, you know. You, you, because it, it, the heads were like, like this. Understood. You know? <laughs> and you go, no. <laughs> and then you understood when you saw him, you go, yeah. and the, the sticks almost fell out of his hand. And bam, and he went, no, that's what he's doing? How do you transfer those ideas understood. to paper? Yeah. But the band, oh, burning, you yeah. know. The Ted Jones Mel Lewis band was the best big well, band of the One of them, one of them. You know, I mean, but, but Ellington the same. You know, you, you had all these different people, and uh, with Louis Belson and all, they were great musicians. But when Louis got into a band, you didn't remember him. You remembered the band. Ellington sounded incredible, and his writing, as a as a composer, Louis Belson was a great, great guide guidepost for me. You know, so I got a lot yeah. from that. So it's the, more the chess guys? More. <laughs> it, it were the chess guys. Really, you got to tell me. I, yeah. I, 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 with all due respect to rock and roll, I yeah. don't think it, so. No. You're right. No. Is there anything you haven't done musically yet uh, and you think one day I really love to do that? Mm -hmm. um, and that's to, to... And now I'm really... And I'm moving in that direction. And that is to compose and write my own orchestral... Uh, composite, uh, orchestral pieces. Uh, there are orchestrations from my music, and there will be at some point very soon uh, a presentation with the Hessische Rundfunk uh, big band okay. of only my music. Just yours. Just my music. Mm -hmm. But someone has orchestrated it, and that's great. Yeah. But I, 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 I know that at some point in time I will do it myself. You know, because I'm looking. I, I like both sides, and that's something I haven't accomplished yet, so I will be doing that. Okay, cool. Please tell us a secret or a funny thing about Billy Copham that nobody knows. That might be difficult. You'd have to ask my wife. <laughs> because... The good thing here. I, I, I really don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I, nobody knows? I don't know. I'm pretty good. I mean, I, I don't have... I, I have secrets. If I have secrets... If, then it must be secrets. I don't. Uh, okay. Some words at last to the fans, please, Billy. To the fans. Um, how can I put this? The days come and go, and many, many artists, many of us are like, how can I put it, uh, seeds in the wind, you know? Um, some. Some stay for a longer time than others, you know. Everybody, all the seeds start at the same level, and it just, and then they only have a, a, a lifespan that's pretty much dependent on which seed it is. So we try to do the best that we can with what we've got. At least I would like to say that. And so in George going, like someone like George Duke or Mulgrew Miller, um, it's an example of their legacies, you know. Mulgrew 
younger than George. Yeah. And I can't say that what he's left behind is any less than what George has left behind. You're right. It's, it depends on, on, on who's listening and who's not. And I'd like to, to respect them in this way. Uh, same thing with McLaughlin. Everybody's different, you know. Uh, when you listen to the music that he, he wrote with, for the M.O., at least. And there were some other things, too. But that, uh, like, My Goals Beyond, things like that. There's some very, very special stuff there. And then when you go beyond us to people like Herbie Hancock or Wayne Shorter, who have this incredibly rich legacy. Yeah. I mean, I think Wayne's approaching his 80s, man. You know, or a Roy Haynes, who's approaching his 90s. Uh, it's a You know, uh, what can I say? What a story. Just musical griots, you yeah. know. That's what it's all about, and that's what we're here to do. Thank you very much, Billy. Thank you. Thank you for the interview. Okay. Bye-bye.